Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, today, we are happy to have Benoit Vicido, who is going to tell us about integrable e models uh, for the change summons theory and affine Godin models. Thank you very much for joining us. So thank you very much. Let me start by thanking the organizers and in particular Miroslav for the invitation. So um, what I want to tell you about is uh, the subject of integrable field theories, more precisely two-dimensional integrable field theories. And uh, I want to tell you about two uh, general unifying frameworks which recently appeared uh, for describing such theories. So one of them is based on 4D churn Simons theory and the other one is based on Affan Godin models. So I'll focus in this talk mostly on uh, 4D churn Simons theory, but I'll mention uh, a bit affine Godin models because it turns out that both formalism are actually intimately related. So um, the, this uh, talk will be based on these two works. So the first is uh, collaboration with uh, Marco Benini and Alexenko, and the last one is with uh, Sylvain Lacroix. So I was told to go uh, to start with a very gentle introduction. So I want to start by uh, defining what I mean for this talk by two-dimensional integrable field theories. Uh, so please do stop me if you have any questions at any point. So um, for the purposes of this talk, uh, I'll take a two-dimensional integrable field theory to be a two-dimensional field theory, which is classically integrable. So I'll focus mostly on classical theories. And integrability will mean that uh, the equations of motion of the theory can be written in the lax form. So they, there exists this uh, connection, which depends on this meromorphic parameter Z, such that uh, if this connection is flat, then the equations of motion hold. This is a, a equivalence statement. So uh, this is known as the lax form for the integrable field theory. So we have this lax connection depending, on, depending meromorphically on this spectral parameter Z. And the aim of the talk will be to um, present uh, one way of extracting from 4D Chan Simons theory such data. So I want to extract uh, an integrable field theory in this in this sense from 4D Chan Simons theory. So uh, let me just give you very simple examples of what integrable field theories are. So the simplest example is possibly sine Gordon theory or sine Gordon theory, whose equations of motion are given by these equations. So it's for a field phi, and uh, this is integrable in the following sense. You can write down this lax pair or lax connection. So it's two by two matrices with uh, these combinations of the field phi and the spectral parameter z. And it's a, a lax connection for the sine Gordon theory because if you compute the curvature for this connection, uh, it's proportional to the equations of motion for sine Gordon. So this here is what I mean by the equations of motion. And so um, the curvature vanishes if and only if the equations of motion for sine Gordon theory hold. Okay, and then another well-known example is the principal Kara model. So uh, this is for a group valued field G. So G is some smooth function on some two-dimensional world sheet valued in some group G. And so you can, uh, th this is the equations of motion where D plus and D minus mean um, like coordinate coordinates derivatives with respect to, uh, on, the, on the world sheet. So if you introduce this um, current G inverse DG, then uh, this is telling you that the, the current is conserved. And uh, the, this, this can be written in lax form uh, by uh, the following expression. So, this expression is uh, equivalent to the equations of motion. And moreover, having introduced this current, it's automatically flat. So in fact, if we compute the curvature of, the, of this lax connection, we recover that this uh, little current J is flat and satisfies uh, the conservation equation. Okay, so the flatness again of the lax equation is equivalent to the equations of motion and uh, of the flatness, uh, which came for free because we introduced this current. Okay, so why are, interest, why are integrable field theories interesting? Sorry, uh, it's because once you have a lax form or once you can write the equations of motion in lax form, uh, you're guaranteed to have an infinite um, family of integrals of motion. So specifically what you have is a flat connection. So if you look at the, um, the Wilson line or the path of the exponential of this connection and you take its trace, this is gonna be independent of the um, time slice at which you take the integral along. So if I take the integral along different time slices in R2, I'm gonna get the same, um, the same quantity for this trace. So it's conserved in time. And so in other words, this quantity here is a generating function for integrals of motion for the theory. Okay, and so what you get is really an infinite number of conserved quantities because you can expand in this spectral parameter Z and at each power in the expansion, you get a new integral of motion. Okay, so 
um, given the usefulness of uh, this lax connection, it's always a mystery where, how it appears or why, why the lax connection is of a given form. And so you have to wonder what the origin of this lax connection is. And so there are two recent formalisms for understanding the origin of lax connections in various integrable field theories. So one of them is more algebraic in nature, and it's based on the Hamiltonian formalism. So this is the, notion, the, the one based on affine Godin models, which I'll describe briefly for comparison. And then later I'll describe, I'll focus in this talk on the geometric formulation of um, the origin of the lax connection, which is uh, based on 4D chern Simons theory. So suppose I have an integrable field theory whose lax connection is G valued, so valued in some Lie algebra, finite dimensional Lie algebra G, then what you can do is you can build the affine katz moody algebra, untwisted affine katz moody algebra associated with G. And uh, from this Lie algebra, we can build uh, what's called the, the Godin model associated with this infinite dimensional Lie algebra. So to write down the lax connection or the lax matrix for the Godin model, it's convenient to introduce uh, dual bases for this affine katz moody algebra like this. So crucially, I have the central extension here and the derivation element. And then I have the loop um, generators and the dual loop generators. So these are dual with respect to the um, um, killing form on the, sorry, the, the non degenerate bilinear form on the affine katz moody algebra. So the idea is that you can generate from uh, the Godin model integrable, uh, integrable field theories by choosing suitable representations of this affine katz moody algebra. So this is an idea that dates back to the paper of Fagan Frankel from the 2007. Uh, this was in the case of KDV theory, and then um, it was elabor elaborated on more recently for um, more general for constructing more general two-dimensional integrable field theories. I should insist this is all classical. So um, the lax connection for the affine Godin model is this expression here. So uh, it's got uh, essentially an, an auxiliary space here, which is um, one copy of the affine katz moody algebra. So uh, and then it has. Uh, it's, you can think of it as a spin chain, but it's a spin chain with infinite dimensional Lie algebra at every site. So this label I here runs over the sides of the spin chain, and you have this inhomogeneity parameter Zi for each site of the spin chain. So what you want to do to obtain the lax connection for an integrable field theory from this data is you want to represent the auxiliary space in terms of um, the following. So you want to represent the IA, the, the loop um, parameter or the loop, the loop variables uh, i a tends to t to the minus n as Fourier modes. So sigma is some coordinate on some uh, circle. And then uh, these guys I want to represent as uh, Fourier modes of a field. So these are labeled by the Lie algebra elements uh, in G, the site, and then some Fourier modes n. And then, so this is uh, the representation of the loop uh, generators. And then I, I should represent the derivation elements as I D by D sigma, and then the central element as zero. So this is for the auxiliary, auxiliary space. And uh, at each site, I choose this representation of uh, representing the Fourier modes, uh, oh, sorry, the, the loop uh, generators by Fourier modes. And then I choose um, the, the dual levels. So dual to the central extension, I have this the central, a dual to the derivation element, I have the central uh, element, and I represent these by numbers ki, and then the derivation element uh, on this on this side I represent by something. It's it's really the um, segal segal operator, but it doesn't really matter here because uh, the central element on the auxiliary space is represented by zero. So all of this together uh, produces a lax connection. So specifically, I have these. Uh, D derivatives times these levels, which produces some uh, meromorphic one form here. So ki over z minus z i dz. So this will play a central uh, role in the uh, 4D Chern Simons theory. And then the, the loop uh, variables get represented into fields. So this these Fourier modes times these guys sum uh, to produce um, the fields of the theory. So the lax connection will be a linear combination of the fields and uh, and I have this uh, connection with crucially this uh, meromorphic one form. So um, because I started with a, a lax connection with ha which has poles at the Z eyes, uh, when on, so, oh, this is the slide. So, uh, 
So on this side, the, the lax connection will typically have uh, poles at the zeros of the meromorphic one forms, which I call the zeta j's here. And so these zeros of the meromorphic one form- I'm sorry, are, could you slow yes. down a little bit? I'm, I'm not following this. Um, okay, so let, yeah. Um, let's see, so uh, are, are we, so we are starting with infinite dimensional representations of the loop, loop group, yes. like, so like yes. Verma module type representations. Uh, I, I'm thinking or here, classic, the integral, or those that you can still associate with integrable highest weight things. Uh, I, I'm thinking here really of um, so it, it um, so um, so it, my my fields will have Fourier modes which satisfy commutation relations, which are those of a Katz-Moody algebra. So. Okay. Um, so if you like, um, let's say I take a simplest example of, um, so let's say I take sine Gordon theory. So I have uh, these fields phi and pi, which are um, fields on the circle and they satisfy this canonical commutation relation. So uh, delta of sigma minus sigma prime. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, um, these, uh, these commutation relations will come from representing my uh, Katz-Moody generators in terms of uh, Fourier modes. So um, it's, so I'm not thinking of um, uh, highest weight representations or um, it's really, uh, um, so, do you remember what's the uh, title of the paper of Fagan and Frankel? I'm actually- Yeah, it's uh, qu um, Quantization of Solitons and Langland's okay. Correspondence, okay. that paper. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in KDV theory, you have one scalar field. So you have uh, really one site at the origin. Uh, so in this case, uh, the number of sites is, is one. And then um, the, client, the KDV field, which is a field five sigma, it appears as, um, so it, you, you have these Fourier mode decomposition for the field. It's a field on the circle. And mm -hmm. so this is uh, the expression for the field. And it, it comes about from representing the Cartan generator of um, SL2 affine. Okay so, okay, so so really this is like times H and this piece here comes from representing the um, affine SL2 generator in, in the auxiliary space. And then these guys come from representing um, the um, I find the copy of the affine Katz-Moody algebra in the, in the, at the side zero. Okay, so it's in the sense that I'm thinking of um, representations inducing uh, field theories. So I'm, at the moment, I'm really thinking classically. So um, it's just that the, the Fourier modes of my field satisfy the same commutation relations as some um, affine Katz-Moody algebra. This is really the, the main point. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, and uh, and 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 so and the 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 arrow to the right is what again? How, how do we get the connection? Uh, this arrow here. Side? This representation. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so here I'm really summing over all Katz-Moody generators. In particular, I have the sum over the loop generators and then the central extension and the derivation element. Okay. So the derivation element, when it gets represented as a derivative with respect to sigma, is what gives rise to this term. Right, so this is just the representation of the derivation element D times the, the, the level. So this is the, the term K tensor D in okay. this, in this. so really K at side I tensor D. Okay. Uh, so all the KIs get represented as numbers, K sub uh -huh. I. And so I get, um, when I, I represent see. that term in, the, in this formal lax connection, I get this omega D sigma, right? And then all the loop generators get represented as the lax connection, which is just some linear combination of the fields. So I'll give you an example in a second with the PCM, how this comes about. Okay. But yeah, the, the, the connection, uh, the, the, the D sigma term comes from representing the derivation element in the auxiliary space. Okay. Yeah. So th this all makes very explicit reference to the world sheet that you're on. Um, yes, yeah. Whereas the, so like in your example, um, uh, like for example, for the, the examples you gave up above, you could just yeah. write down a formula for the conserved current, um, which didn't 
make any reference to the the world sheet like yeah here j is g inverse dg that that should work on any world sheet yes that's right so i'm really thinking of field theories on the cylinder here because i want my fields to have Fourier mode decomposition so i have a compact space direction i'm in the hamiltonian formalism so i don't really have a time direction it's really fields on s1 and then they have a Fourier decomposition which is what allows me to think of them as representations of um of loop generators from an affine Katsumudi algebra. So I'm really thinking specifically of field theories on S1, Hamiltonian field theories on S1. So uh, yes, the cylinder, um, if, you include, if you include time. But you're right, I mean, these field theories would make sense on a general two-dimensional uh, world sheet, yes. But here, when I'm realizing them as representations of affine Godin models, I'm really thinking of them as living on the circle. And then when you're talking about spin chains, the N here is the number of poles in, in the connection that, you, that you're putting on the world sheet. Um. Mm -hmm. um, it, yes. So the N is really the number of fields. So for sign Gordon, um, you'd really have one site. Um, for the PCM also, there's one field. It's a G-valued field. And so I have one site. So it's really not a spin chain in the usual sense. Um, it's really an infinite dimensional spin chain where at each side you have an infinite dimensional V algebra. And so you can have spin chains with just two sides. And this is uh, interesting already. So typically the number of sides of the spin chain is the number of fields of G, G valued fields of your theory. Okay, yeah. but when, so when you're talking about spin chain, you're not doing it in the sense of our, we're obtaining conformal field theories, which are continuum limits of spin the, spin no, chains. No. You're talking about. I'm this. not gonna. Yeah, I'm not gonna take a continuum limit because really my spin chains are typically a very small number of sites. So this is really a, um, a spin chain where the sites carry um, the different fields of the theory. So at each site, I have these are the zeds. I have a copy of the affine Katsumudi algebra. And each of them gets represented uh, as one field in the following way. Okay, so the point is yeah. then that you're thinking of CP1 as the Riemann sphere, and you're going to then think of this in radial quantization in, in order to get it into your cylinder picture? Um, I'm not. So in this talk, I'll focus on classical theories. But really, I, I'm thinking of quantizing these theories as um, Hamiltonian field theories on the circle. So time is sort of. Um, one of the, um, so you have time translation, but this is one of the infinite dimensional symmetries of these integrable field theories. So really, um, so I, I don't want to really think too much about uh, quantization in this, in this talk, but it's really, um, I mean, yeah, th but think of- connection is not yeah. time translation invariant if these Zs all have different absolute values, right? Uh, what do you mean by time here? For me, time is generated by the Hamiltonian, which is um, essentially quadratic expression. It's a, it, it's a quadratic expression in the field. So if, if I call this, uh, so typically it will be like the trace of the lax squared. So my Hamiltonian will be trace of lax like this. Um, and then some residue in the Z. So let's say residue at Zi summed over I and then uh, some integral over D sigma. So this is my Hamiltonian. And this generates um, time translation on my fields. All right, so typically this will be, I'm oh, sorry, trace squared. So this will be uh, quadratic in the fields because the lax matrix is linear in the fields. And so this is some uh, operator classical quadratic field, which um, induces time translation. I define time translation to be Poisson brackets with this Hamiltonian. So the fact, uh, yeah, the, the ZIs are just constant and, and the theory is a, a well-defined classical integrable field theory for any choice of ZIs. Does that answer your question? Uh, I mean, the, the, the CP1 minus the, the, these poles, is yeah. that your world sheet or? No, no my world sheet is uh -huh. um, another, is an, so Sigma is not nothing to do with the CP1. The, okay, so sorry. this is just yes. some auxiliary space you're using as, yeah. to, as a maybe a target yes. space for your fields or something. Yeah, so Z has nothing to do with the world sheet coordinates. Z is just the auxiliary spectral parameter. It's the, th it's the thing in which I'm going to expand in to produce integrals of motion. So remember that 
I have uh, these um, world chief coordinates sigma plus and sigma minus, and then I introduce this new auxiliary parameter Z, which parameterizes a CP1. It's an yeah, auxiliary okay. property of CP1. Yeah. Okay, this is an important clarification, but this might become clearer in the 4D Chen Simons picture where both will be present. The world sheet and CP1 will be present. Okay, so okay. this CP1 and the choice of the locations of the poles and your Lie algebra, that's the data you need to formulate this field theory? Exactly, yeah. This is all data. Exactly. So you don't think of this as uh, some kind of an analog of the regular Godin model associated with finite dimensional Lie algebra, right? I do think of it as an analog. It's an analog for an affine Katsumudi algebra. Um, so okay, this, so. this is what I, I would call the Lax matrix for the Godin model. Um, and so the Lax matrix um, is a function of Z, which is this auxiliary parameter. In mm -hmm. the finite dimensional case, I have a finite finitely algebra with a finite basis. So this is a finite sum. And so, so in the in a finite dimensional case, I would have uh, as many spins, right, as you yes. have disease. Yes. The, the yes, punctures, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so the, I claim the, 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 the same here, right? Just he has an infinite dimensional representation on each side. Uh, associated right? at each z. Okay. And what yes, are the exactly. zetas? As the zetas are the zeros of omega. So they don't play much role here in the in the Godin story because the poles are the zeta's. But I'm just em emphasizing here that when I produce the Lax connection. So what, what people usually call the Lax connection of a field theory is this guy. And mm -hmm. it's related to the Lax connection of the Godin model by multiplying by omega. So you see that the, the, loop, the loop part of the Katsumudi algebra gets represented as omega L. Okay. And so because it came from something with poles only at the zi's, um, the, the Lax connection, which people usually think of as the Lax connection of the field theory has poles at the zeros of omega. Now, this is what I'm saying here. So, so the Lax connection L here has poles at the zetas, mm -hmm. and these are precisely the zeros of omega. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Uh, but just to talk, to emphasize that th this is really parallel to finite Godin models, you can also think of certain finite dimensional integrable systems as representations in the same way of finite Godin models. You pick a finite dimensional representation of your finite Lie algebra, and then you do the same thing. And um, for example, there's um, something called the Neumann model or the, so the Neumann model is describing an anisotropic oscillator constraint to the sphere. Um, you have uh, like spinning tops, a lot of spinning tops are Godin models. You can think of lots of finite dimensional systems in this way as representations of finite Godin models. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so let me give you um, an example of uh, how a field theory comes about as, as a representation of a Godin model. Maybe this will make it clearer. So. Um, so here I'm thinking of a Godin model with some irregular singularities. So there's a double pole at the origin. So above I've told you, I've shown you the, the formula for the Lax connection for a Godin model with irregular singularities, but then you have generalizations where at each site, instead of assigning a copy of the Katsumudi algebra, I take a copy of the Katsumudi algebra um, with um, tensor with um, truncated uh, Taylor series in some um, parameters. So typically I have a G with uh, um, adjoin some formal variable, and then I quotient by this variable squared, for example. So this would introduce an, an irregular singularity of order two, where the field content at the site would be um, represent, a representation of G and G tensors uh, epsilon I. So I have two sort of two fields at this site, right? So, um, in this case here, I'm thinking of um, a Godin model with a double pole at the origin and a double pole at infinity. So I claim this will give rise to the PCM. So I have double pole at zero and at infinity. And uh, the field content is obtained by representing these formal Katsmudi generators, which are labeled by um, the um, epsilon. So here, eps the, the Katsmudi algebra at uh, the origin is uh, G um, plus G cross uh, epsilon i. And so uh, I represent these two guys to produce uh, two fields. So specifically here, I want to rep represent this as, um, when, when I represent this in a certain way, what I claim I get is uh, minus um, g tau, which is the, t uh, the time component of the current, which I introduced above. And then here, what I get is the um, d sigma uh, plus the spatial component of j. 
So I claim that I, I can construct a representation of these Katsumudi algebras uh, such that um, uh, from representing these um, formal generators, what I get is these currents. So the reason is because these currents here have Poisson brackets, which are the same as the commutation relations for these formal generators. So these, these, this is a Katsumudi algebra with some formal relations. So um, I've adjoined this copy of epsilon to one, to one of these copies of the algebra, but I have the algebra relations for this, um, for this infinite dimensional Lie algebra. And when I represent these, I get the standard canonical Poisson bracket relations between the two components of the current. Okay. Um, and at infinity, what I have is something which is central in the, in the um, Godin algebra. So it commutes with everything. So I can represent it as some number. And what I do is I represent it as D sigma. I just represent everything as zero except for the derivation element. So all of this put together, um, what you get out of it is the lax connection of the PCM uh, times this uh, crucial one form, which is uh, encoding the Poisson structure of the, of the principal current model. So in general, um, in the Godin model story, this, this twist function, or so this, this meromorphic one form will be some function phi z times dz. And this function crucially con controls the, the Poisson structure of the lax connection of the, of the theory. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just, I, I haven't told you exactly how to do this uh, to represent these fields, but um, I'm saying that th there is a representation of these generators, which um, uh, gives rise to these uh, usual um, components of the Katsumudi, of the uh, PCM, um, which satisfy certain well-known Poisson bracket relations, which are representations of these formal Katsumudi generators. Okay. So the purpose of this talk is not so much about Godin models, but I just wanted to highlight this because of the parallel it will, and uh, they'll be with um, the 4D Chen Simons picture. So 4D Chen Simons is another way of obtaining, uh, of constructing integrable field theories, uh, but more from a Lagrangian perspective. So rather than choosing representations, what, what we'll choose is some uh, boundary conditions for the um, gauge field A of the Chern Simons theory. So, specifically, we start from this 4D Chern Simons theory, which was introduced by Costello in 2013 and then um, developed um, extensively by Costello, Witt, and Yamazaki. And more recently, this was uh, understood in the, how to produce integrable field theories in, um, by Costello and Yamazaki. So, what I'll present is an alternative to their way of constructing um, field theory. So they also extract from this 4D Chen Simons theory two dimensional integrable field theory. But the procedure I'll show you is a bit different. It, it, um, it relies on, on the introduction of edge modes, which I'll, I'll describe later. So, starting from this 4D action, the, the data you'll see is, is very similar to the data for the Godin model. So, this omega here is the same meromorphic one form as we had before. So, before it came about as um, the representation of the central element of the lax connection of the Affan Godin model. But this is just some input. to remind us so the two directions are holomorphic and two, two of them are topological. Right? Yes. So the directions of the world sheet are topological, right? So we're yeah, so this is the world sheet. So to answer the question from before, here you see explicitly the world sheet sigma and um, this um, spectral plane uh, CP1. So indeed, this is a holomorphic direction and this is topological in this theory. Um, so because I'm wedging with omega here, the Chern Simons three form, I can um, for free get rid of the DZ direction in the connection because it drops out from the, from the action. So in other words, I have a gauge um, symmetry which um, allows me to add any multiple of DZ to the, to the connection A. And so this allows me to just get rid of it, setting it to zero. So the idea will be to um, turn this um, one form uh, to into the lax connection. So in other words, I want to turn the um, gauge field of the Chern Simons theory into the lax connection. So there'll be two issues, which is the first is that there's this dz bar component, which I don't Can have. Can I ask a question? So, sorry. Yes, please. So in the original setting of, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm not familiar with the Costello Yamazaki, but under, in the original setting of, mm -hmm. of, of Costello Witten and Yamazaki's papers, yes. uh, omega would have been just um, a holomorphic one form Absolutely. of the Riemann yes. surface. And there would be, yeah. so in other words, it would not be more, there would be no poles. Absolutely, yes. And right. there we could insert Wilson lines. Yes. Right? 
what you're telling us to do is something else. So to consider, so, yeah. you, do you think of introducing polls as having something to do with the Wilson lines or not, nothing at all? Uh, no, uh, so, so I think the Wilson line picture is the picture which allows you to construct lattice models. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and then I think one of the motivations of Costello Yamazaki was to take this limit where the Wilson lines get denser and denser to form a surface defect. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what, what I've tried to represent here is a surface defect, which is these are surface defects localized at the ZIs. Okay. So I think they call these, mm -hmm. um, they call these disorder, uh, disorder defects. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think maybe, yeah, this is a good point. So in Costello, Witt and Yamazaki, in fact, what Omega has is no zeros. So it's a, it's a um, meromorphic one form with no zeros on the Riemann surface. So you can have a sphere with a DZ uh, or DZ over Z. So this gives rise to um, rational and trigonometric systems. And then you can look at um, tori uh, or um, an ellipse and then the uh, meromorphic one form on the ellipse, which gives rise to elliptic models. Uh, they were holomorphic one forms in, in those settings. So all of those were flat. So you either think of it as a flat C or, yes. or yes. C star or a, so it, they were strictly holomorphic. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. I, yes. So they're holomorphic. I, I agree. So if you if you work with uh, the complex plane, so not CP one, and then you put DZ on it, this is holomorphic. Um, and then yeah, DZ over Z would would be holomorphic on the um, punctured complex plane. Yes, that's right. Um, so this is a very different setting. So it turns out that uh, they didn't need this in the in, in the lattice model story. I'm not 100% sure why or what would happen if you introduce such generalized uh, one forms in that setting, whether you'd be able to construct more general lattice models. But in the field theory case, it's essential to introduce um, more general meromorphic one forms with poles and zeros. So this makes perfect sense when you're coming from the Godin model perspective because this is a very natural object that appears as a representation of the central element of the Godin model. Okay, uh, so it's just part of the data here. So I agree, it's, it's different to the Costello Witt and Yamazaki story, but it's it's just um, it's it's extra necessary data for constructing field theories. Okay. Um, so yeah, the the as I said, the the idea will be to uh, turn this uh, connection A here into the Lax connection. So we'll have to get rid of this uh, DZ bar term. And also we'll have to make sure this becomes meromorphic in the CP1. Okay. Um, so yeah, what I said before is that there are these surface defects which are precisely at the singularities of the one form omega. So they're really, the singularities are all along sig uh, sigma and localized at these points ZIs. So we call this the surface defects which is this disjoint union of copies of sigma. Uh, attached to these different points. So this is my name for the set of ZIs, the set of poles of omega, Z underlined. So I have these copies of the surface defect sigma um, at these different points. Did you connect this with the uh, other notions of surface defects that appears in string theory? Uh, I'm not familiar enough to make this connection, but it's... Uh, so, uh, surface defects say that in, in context of AGT, for example. Yeah. Well, well, the CP1 so you, you the mean, yeah, it's, I don't know if it's a surface defect in, like, it, I don't know if you could talk about the field theory living on one side and the other because these you see are localized points. I don't know what, there's not one. Uh, I mean, um, these theories do, do come from the same world as, 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 as yes. uh, you know, as AGT. And, and uh, it does make sense to, uh, okay. to basically look at Riemann surfaces, which have, you know, <laughs> tubes sticking out. Um, which would actually correspond to uh, surface defects in, in, in some string theory construction. Okay, go ahead, very interesting. Yeah, but so you would okay, need like this two, is something... more, two more directions for the 4D theory, right? Like the, this arc no, theory. these all come from six dimensional theory. So it's, uh, it's, it, it, make, it, it does make good, they, they come from, well, lattice models come from a li little string theory version of the, of the, of the, of, of Gaiotis to zero theory, but uh, the same constructions make sense. It makes sense to put it on a Riemann surface with tubes, and you certainly do have surface defects, it, which would introduce, which would come about like this. With, um, I'm, with, I'm sure with, there's a very deep connection. Yes. Um, so maybe I can just mention in relation to your um, bringing up 60 theories. In fact, there's a 60 version of holomorphic Jan Simons, uh, which in fact is sort of a lift of this uh, to 
six dimensions? Well, from what we understood uh, with Nikita, some, some unpublished work, uh, the actually the, the four dimensional version does come from yeah. a six dimensional string theory. Yeah. Okay. And and actually, uh, but I'm sorry, I can't hear. Uh, Just keep going. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Yes. So um, so yeah, th there are these surface defects where omega has singularities. So um, because there are these singularities, you might worry that the action is not well defined. But it turns out that actually, because these are simple poles, the action, the, 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 this Lagrangian is uh, locally integrable around the surface defects. But, so, uh, but but you have not, this is still um, um, transformist theory associated with finite, with a, with, with the standard gauge group, right? With a, Absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So in this story, I'm not making the, the gauge group affine. Okay. Compared yeah. to the affine story, yeah. So right. here you see the affinization is coming from the fact that I have this um, sigma explicitly present, which is sort of, um, I mean. Right. So, so yeah. in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the story that one would have told from, from our angle, um, Mm -hmm. uh, surface defects would have been associated with infinite dimensional representations. So, so that, that does work. Uh, okay, okay, keep going. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, yes. Oh, hold on. Surface defects are finite dimensional representations, right? No, so infinite dimensional. No, no, there's I mean, some trunca truncations, right? So, do... it, okay, we shouldn't, we, we shouldn't, we, we shouldn't, we should let him tell his story. Okay, but... I, think we should, I think we should move on. Yeah. If, yeah. Okay. Um, so the action is uh, well defined. So I'm mentioning this because there's a generalization of this, which is also in our paper, where we introduce high order poles. So, for example, I could have um, a certain order pole of, of any order here, and then I have different um, labels for the for the residues. So, in fact, when you go to higher order poles, uh, the action is not well defined, and you need some sort of regularization of the action. But I can discuss this later if you're interested. So this is just to say that there, there could be subtleties in, define the action, in defining the action, but when you have simple poles, uh, this is perfectly well defined. So uh, the first question we want to ask is, um, is this action gauge invariant? And I'm concerned about uh, gauge invariants on the finite gauge transformation, so large gauge transformations, not just infinitesimal ones. So I take a general g-valued um, smooth function on, the, on this uh, sigma cross c, and I want to understand the behavior of the action on the gauge transformations, and the hope is to make um, this gauge invariant by introducing suitable boundary conditions on the gauge field A. So if you just compute the variation of the action on the gauge transformations, you find these two additional terms. So this is very familiar for people who've worked on 3D transignments. So there are these two extra terms. So typically this term disappears because we don't have the omega wedge. So it's, um, it's an exact um, term. And so if the, if the gauge field vanishes at the boundary of the theory of the space, sorry. And so let's say we have a three dimensional space with boundary. If the gauge field vanishes at the boundary, then this term disappears. And then what you find is that um, this Vesemini uh, uh, Witten 3 form produces uh, an integer. So if the gauge field vanishes at infinity, what you get is um, um, an integer from this, this term. And so the action is not quite gauge invariant, but it's gauge invariant up to a multiple of 2 pi, which, uh, as we know, this just means that the path integral is actually gauge invariant. So, I want to emphasize that in our story here, the, the action will actually be gauge invariant on the nose without any shift. So this will be coming from the choice of boundary condition at, um, at the surface defects. So um, let me first rewrite this action uh, a bit differently. So I'm going to read oh, this variation. I'm going to rewrite this integral over x in terms of integrals over sigma only. So I'm going to localize the integral over sigma. So to write this, I need to introduce uh, what we call the defect Lie group and the defect Lie algebra. So this is just uh, a bunch of copies of the Lie group um, for each surface defect. So this is a direct product of, of the Lie group G. And then the corresponding direct product of the Lie algebras is its Lie algebra. And then on this defect Lie algebra, I have a natural bilinear pairing, which depends on the um, levels of the one form. So remember that the one form uh, I can write, so it keeps doing this. Um, I've introduced some new notation here. So the levels K are labeled now by points of, of the, um, of the um, uh, by poles of omega. So omega really is sum over its poles and then Kx over Z minus X dx, uh, dz, okay. So these are still the same as before. It's just the levels. And then you just take a linear combination of the bilinear pairings for each copy of the Lie algebra weighted by these levels. So this is a natural bilinear pairing on the defect Lie algebra. And then I have this embedding of the def surface defect or copies of the surface defect into the full space. 
And the crucial thing to note is that if I pull back a, a function on the total space to the surface defect by this embedding, so for example, if I take uh, the group valued field G, uh, then pulling it back to the surface defect, what I get is just um, a, a copy, uh, various copies of G, G valued functions on sigma. And so in fact, what I have is, is just a function on sigma valued in the defect group. Okay, so pulling back a uh, function valued in the group G uh, living on, this, on the space X, if I pull it back to the surface defect, what I get is a function on sigma, I can interpret it as a function on sigma valued in the defect group. And similarly, if I pu pull back a Lie algebra valued one form on X, what I get is a defect, val defect Lie algebra valued one form on sigma. Okay, and so in terms of this uh, notation, I can, I can rewrite these two terms uh, here. I can rewrite these two terms in terms of localized integrals over the defect sigma. So I, I have these two integrals over sigma. So one of them, which came from this integral of the churn simon uh, of the Weizmann newton 3 form is uh, localized on a cylinder. So sigma cross an interval, okay. And G hat here is just an extension of um, my um, group valued element, which now lives on sigma. So the pullback of the group valued element of the surface defect, it's a function on sigma. And I'm thinking of it, uh, I, I'm extending it uh, away from the, the surface on the interval, okay. So is this clear? So I've just rewritten the variation. Now, what I want to do is, is find suitable boundary conditions on the gauge field and the gauge transformation parameter to make these two terms vanish. And so um, the natural thing to do is to take the gauge connection uh, to be valued in uh, some isotropic subalgebra. So let me remind you what this means. So I just take a specific subalgebra of the defect Lie algebra, which has the property that's isotropic. So this means that uh, if I take the Lie bracket, uh, the inner product of any two elements of this Lie algebra, I get zero, okay? And so uh, if I choose my um, connection to, to be such that it's pullback to the boundary or to the defect is valued in K, and similarly the pullback of the group of the, of the gauge transformation parameter to the defect is valued in K, then this whole thing will be zero because this will be valued in K and this will be valued in K. So by choice of the isotropy of the Lie algebra K, this will be zero. So this is a natural choice of boundary to condition to introduce um, on the gauge field at the defects. So specifically, I'll introduce what, what we can call strict boundary conditions. So I'll take the, gate, the bulk gauge field and the gauge transformation parameters uh, to satisfy these relations. So if I pull them back to the surface defects, they are uh, functions on sigma valued in the defect Lie algebra and the defect Lie group but I want to restrict them to be more precisely in this isotropic subalgebra and the corresponding subgroup. Okay. And as I said, uh, this choice guarantees that um, my uh, action is actually gauge invariant. So it's a, it's a choice of boundary condition that makes the 4D transignments to be gauge invariant. So it's important to emphasize that this is actually non-local on CP1, this boundary condition, because it connects uh, the so if you, if you think about the gauge field, you're pulling it back to the surface defect, but the surface defect is multiple copies of sigma at different points zi. And we're basically imposing one condition on, on all of these values of the gauge field at these different points. So this is uh, sort of non-local on CP1 because it depends on the value of the gauge field at these different points. We're requiring that this collection of fields takes values not in GZ, but in this isotropic subalgebra. Okay. So I think these isotropic subalgebras were used in, um, in the papers by Kosselowit and Yamazaki as boundary conditions as well. They took Lagrangian subalgebras of the, of the um, defect Lie algebra in a similar way. Okay, so the first main theorem is just that the action is now gauge invariant having imposed such boundary conditions. So I call these strict boundary conditions um, because um, you can summarize imposing these boundary conditions in the following way. So, um, Mathematically, we can think of this as being imposed by some pullback construction. So what we have to start with is some bulk fields. So these are gauge field A and, and gauge transformation parameter G, which are living on all of X and valued in the Lie algebra G. And what I want is that, um, so I can take that pullback to the surface defect. So this, uh, as I said, gives us uh, one forms and functions on sigma valued in the defect Lie algebra and defect Lie group. And what I want them to be is valued in this isotropic subalgebra K or subgroup K. So in other words, I have boundary fields, which are living in this, on the boundary only and taking values in this um, sub isotropic subalgebra K. 
and I want that the pullback of my bulk fields to the boundary um, is k valued. So what I'm doing is constructing the pullback to construct the space of fields with boundary conditions. I'm just constructing the pullback of um, I'm using the pullback construction. So uh, what this does is it identifies the pullback of um, the bulk fields to the defect with some defect fields, which are k-valued. Okay. So um, this is not something which is very natural to do in a gauge theory because we're identifying gauge fields with inequality, whereas gauge fields more naturally want to be identified by gauge transformations. So it's more natural in the gauge theory to actually impose weaker boundary conditions, which relates the boundary um, gauge field to the pullback of the bulk gauge field by some gauge transformation. Question, what is the physical interpretation of these boundary fields? Um, it's, so the boundary fields themselves, I don't think have an interpretation as far as I'm aware. The, the main thing is that I want my bulk fields to restrict to some, to be uh, valued in some subalgebra. This is the main thing. Um, so, Specifically, what values the, the bulk fields restrict to on the boundary is not really important, but all I care about is that they're valued in this subalgebra. So in fact, you see that B, you don't really need this, the field B, it's, it's just equal to the, the pullback of the bulk field. So all I'm, I'm, all I'm requiring really is that the pullback of the bulk field is valued in, in K. This is what I'm asking. Okay. And similarly for the, for the gauge transformation. So, uh, yeah, I don't know of any physical interpretation of these boundary um, fields. So I, I was saying that um, in the gauge theory, it's more natural to identify gauge fields uh, via gauge transformations. So uh, in fact- uh, Sorry, the remind to... me, what is K? K is this isotropic subalgebra. Do you have different choices of it? Yeah, I can choose many different things. So- What are the labeled by? Um, good question. Uh, So they're labeled, you can define, well, a family of them is labeled by Young-Baxter, solutions of a Young-Baxter equation. You can construct, if you have a solution of Young-Baxter equation on G, uh, sorry, GZ, you can construct a, an isotropic subalgebra corresponding to this solution of Young-Baxter. Um, I don't know more generally, so. How about if we, if we pick, if we pick G to be a UN gauge group or something? Um, I mean, uh, AM yeah. the algebra. Yes. So, I mean, notice that I'm talking about subalgebras of this extended Lie algebra. So really you're gonna have multiple copies of the Lie algebra G, GLN. And um, so, I don't know. I mean, it's a good question. I, off the top of my head, I can't tell you what the answer is for GLN, uh, but... Um, when you say there are many choices, there should be finite yeah. many, right? It should yes, be something that, yeah, like, sure, for GLN, yes. it should be something like the number of, of Young diagrams of, of with n boxes yes. or something like that. Um, something like that, but I, I, okay, I can't, I can't. Actually, precisely that. Yeah, exactly. You think so? Precisely labeled by Young diagrams. But so you have n copies, right? You're looking at uh, subalgebras of GLN uh, n copies, and you want subalgebras with the property that they're isotropic. And the sorry. thing is that they're. they're sorry, they're sorry, sorry. No, at each, so. You have a choice at each surface defect, right? Exactly, and you, you have a choice of, of a, a number which I called ki. Yeah, so at each, so, so I'm just talking about a space of choices on one surface defect. Ah, ah yeah, okay, so well, if you, you have one surface one. defect, yes, if you and have one surface is... defect, then typically, um, I mean, one example is the Borel subalgebra. This is isotropic, or it really, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, nilpotent subalgebra is isotropic with respect to the canonical Filling form on the, on yeah, the there are some correspondence, I think, with it. But at the end of the day, I think it's some for GLN, it's something like the, the number of partitions uh, with n boxes, but little n. Yeah. Um, that's possible, yes. I need to check. So, for example, for, for SL2, there's one choice. Yes. Up to, up to isomorphism, yes. I think I agree. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, this is an important point. Up to, up to now, there's um, the data which I've introduced is, is omega and now a k, which in, uh, specifies boundary conditions. So I'll introduce more data later on. 
And this is all data which the field theory will depend on, the, the resulting two-dimensional integrable field theory. So gradually, as I go along, I introduce more data. So this was part of the action, the omega, and then K now is just uh, imposing a certain class of boundary conditions on the, on the gauge field A. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so a, a more natural way of imposing boundary conditions in gauge field, uh, gauge theories is to impose them up to gauge transformation. So I want to say that the, the bulk field pulls back to the defect uh, and takes values in the, this isotropic subalgebra up to a gauge transformation. And so the way to do this uh, formally is to do um, what's called a homotopy pullback. So um, it's the same, same kind of pullback, but it's, it's a pullback which is sort of more adapted to working with, um, let's say here, the, the model category of groupoids. So um, groupoids form a two category, and this pullback is a two categorical pullback for the groupoids. In other words, um, uh, groupoids form a, a model category with weak equivalences, which are equivalences groupoids. And if I take the naive pullback, then I don't necessarily preserve weak equivalences. So if I take uh, weak, weak, weakly equivalent uh, groupoids in all these entries here, I don't necessarily get a weakly equivalent uh, pullback. So a way to get a, a pullback which respects weak equivalences on groupoids is to take homotopy pullbacks. So this is just the uh, mathematical justification for considering these more general notion of pullbacks. But luckily there's a very concrete description of this homotopy pullback, which is the following. So as I said, the, the key is really that what, what we're doing is we're saying that the pullback of the gauge field down here, the pullback of the gauge field A will not be equal to the gauge field B, but it will be equal to it up to some gauge transformation. So I have some gauge transformation parameter, which I call H, and this will be the edge mode. And it's, it sort of witnesses the equality between the pullback of the bulk gauge field and the boundary gauge field. Okay, so specifically the data which, um, enters the description of the homotopy pullback is um, the bulk gauge field and this edge mode, which is a um, field which is living on the surface defects, or in other words, we can think of it as a field on sigma valued in the defect Lie algebra. And as I said, what it does is it witnesses the equality between the pullback of the bulk gauge field and the boundary gauge field. Okay, so this is a crucial relation which will be important later. So this is a connection, a relationship between the edge mode and the bulk gauge field. We're saying that the gauge transformation of the pullback of the bulk gauge field to the defect by the edge mode is valued in K. This is the key thing. Okay. And then uh, once we impose such, um, um, well, th this is the sort of the, um, the objects of the groupoid, uh, which is making up the, the pullback, the homotopy pullback, and then the, the morphisms of these gauge transformations. So you have unconstrained gauge transformations on the bulk field. But then the, the edge mode transforms correspondingly, in particular such that this constraint is preserved. So this is a constraint which we'll have to solve later, which relates to the bulk gauge field and the edge mode. Uh, can I ask okay. a question? Yes. Are you able to introduce Wilson lines in the story? Yes. Uh, so, yes. Uh, so, I mean, you can, and I mean, it's a very interesting story. So these would live, would live on sigma. At least that's one class of Wilson lines you can consider. And um, so in other so words- there will be lines in sigma. Exactly, yes. So th remember sigma is this uh, copy of R2. So you'd have lines here. And in fact, this Wilson line would really be a quantization once you go to the quantum 4D transcendence theory, a quantization of this object, which I talked about here. So this, so this is, is not the old Wilson line. This is not the what, sorry? It's not the old Wilson line that it was there in like- Oh, no, no it's not, it's not. No. Good, very good, okay, no, excellent. It should not be, because it would make sense, very good, okay. Yeah, so as I said, the, the motivation for Costello Yamazaki were to take these old Wilson lines and sort of condense them, take the continuum limit of this lattice model to produce a field theory. This is why they, this is how they arrived at the, the, the idea of using surface defects to describe field theories, whereas the old Wilson lines which were living on this sigma were describing lattice models. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we take this homotopy pullback, which actually, has this can you tell why? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just, why? why uh, well, I, I I believe that they should not make sense. Why, from your perspective, don't don't do they not make sense? Why does not make what sense does what to introduce sense? the old kind of Wilson line? Well, um, since, since naively okay, you didn't actually so, modify much of much of the construction. No, I mean because it's because what you want in the end is fields living on on sigma, and so the sigma is the, is the world sheet of the field theory you want in the end. So it's natural to have surface defects that lie entirely on this on this surface defect. 
So you, you want you want surface defects because you're producing. But all you told things. you see was what bothers me is this. Okay. Naively, all 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 we all, all you said you are going to do is um, we'll we'll start with uh, this four dimensional transformation theory and we'll yeah. modify we'll modify what what uh, what um, is this holomorphic direction there for yes. it to be um, you know some some Riemer surface on which. Um, uh, on which, yeah, I mean, you know, with yeah, tubes sticking out. One, yes. yes, yes. So um, from that perspective, I should be okay um, introducing Wilson on. It's unsurprising that you can't, but yeah. um, but they should not fit, and I don't see why they should not fit. <laughs> Sorry, <Yeah. laughs> from, from the, I'm, I, mean, I don't the, see from yes. from perspective how we got to this description. Yes, I see why from string theory they shouldn't fit. Um, that you can't do both at the same time, but. I mean, my, my explanation is just that uh, if I want to produce field theories, this is what I have to do. It's sort of, I'm giving you sort of ingredients for producing field theories. So if you want to produce interesting field theories, and I showed you before their description from a Godin model perspective, you need this omega, which is general. If you don't have a general omega, you can't produce interesting field theories. So in particular, for the PCM, I showed you, you have omega is uh, one over z squared minus one dz. This is not of the type which uh, Costello, Witt, and Yamazaki considered. So, no, it's not, it's, yeah, it's not. But it's totally in there, in there. I mean, just because they considered the flat, uh, I mean, they, they, they assumed their, their Riemann surface to be flat. Yes, exactly. uh, But you could still imagine that, you know, <laughs> yeah, but, so, let, let me approach, you know, pick a small patch of your Riemann surface. The yes. locally, it's, everything is nice, yes, perfectly holomorphic. True. Yes. Um, but, so some, I mean, the so some, something's missing. Yeah, I mean, the answer is I'm not exactly sure why they haven't considered more general omegas, global meromorphic one forms like this um, in their story. I mean, what was nice in their story was that they sort of re-derived this classification of, you know, trigonometric, rational, and elliptic for solutions of Young-Baxter by saying But you see, the, what they said is that to get an R matrix, all you do is, is, is study a silly scattering problem where you just, yes, exactly. you know, have two Wilson lines. Yes. And it's true. So what yes. prevents me from adding two Wilson lines in your story that just, you know, um, uh, they, 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 uh, Wilson lines on CP1? I mean, they would contract the point, right? No, 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 no. The, the Wilson sigma. lines were in, in, in this thing that he calls sigma. There'd be lines yeah. in sigma. Yeah. But can you add those on top of the, two, of the surface defects? In string theory, no. But in the words that okay. you have said so far, nothing prevents me from doing it. And that's what bothers me. Okay. Um, Rather, in string theory, I could do, I, I could introduce some lines, but they would not look like their lines. It, 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 mm -hmm. the, the... But can you introduce lines where uh, this omega has singularities? Can you introduce lines on, on the surface where one of the fields has singularities or one of the, I mean, th these, are, these are really sort of singularities of the, of the Lagrangian these surface defects. So I don't know, it's not clear to me. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I don't know the answer. Why, whether you could or couldn't introduce uh, line defects on top of what's already present. Okay. Um, so, so I've introduced this um, alternative notion of pullback and I've described for you concretely what it means. So you have this new field called the edge mode. Uh, so to tell you the upshot, it will be that the edge mode will turn out to be the field, the field of the two dimensional theory. So it's a field which naturally lives on the surface defect. It lives on sigma. And so this will be the field data of the two dimensional field theory and A will be its lax connection. So this is the sort of upshot of the construction. Um, so to get to this action for the two-dimensional field theory, we're gonna keep working on the action for the 4D Chern Simons theory. So um, now that I've introduced this al alternative pullback, uh, I should tell you how to write down an action for the gauge field coupled to the edge mode. So it turns out that you can write down this action quite naturally. Uh, so these, these, you take the original uh, 4D Chern Simons action and you add to it two terms, which depend on the edge mode and which couple the edge mode to the gauge field. And this coupling is such that the whole thing is gauge invariant. That's really what's going on. 
So the action here is still not gauge invariant, but these two terms cancel the, the non-gauge invariance of this original action. And this action you can obtain um, more precisely as um, it's from this homotopy pullback construction, uh, because there's some relationship between the usual pullback and the homotopy pullback. It turns out in this case, they're equivalent as categories or as, as groupoids. And uh, you can use this equivalence to actually pull back the action for the usual 4D Chan Simons action to the to the homotopy pullback. Sorry, yeah, to the homotopy pullback. So, um, so, so basically, I should think of this as the picture that you drew of the Riemann surface really yeah. should have um, a finite size holes, not punctures, but finite size holes. So, okay, so there are two types of holes. So maybe let's clarify what kind of holes you're talking about. So there, there, there are holes at the zetas because that's where A will have singularities. And then there are holes there. I, I don't think there are holes at the zetas. There's no need to put holes here because as I said, the, the action or the Lagrangian is well-defined. It's perfectly bounded near these points. So it turns out that near the defects, the action is actually finite. But okay. at the same time, uh, I mean, just extending the usual ordinary Charles analogy, right? Yeah. In ordinary Charles the theory, yes. we get W is W when I consider the theory in a manifold with boundaries. Yes. So I would like to get boundaries or... Yes, um, but I think this is quite different here. I, so I don't think these, this surface defect are boundaries. I mean, uh, every, everything here is perfectly well-defined. I, I mean, my gauge field is, is smooth and, and regular near, the, near these points and the Lagrangian is, is perfectly finite. So I think where there are maybe boundaries is, uh, or singularities, um, or wh where you certainly need to put punctures, I think is at these eta eyes, because remember that uh, what I want to do is turn A into the lax connection. And the lax connection I told you has poles at, um, so it has poles at these uh, zeta eyes. And so I want my gauge field to blow up at these zeta eyes. And to do that naively, I should cut out poles. I should cut out points at the zeta eyes. But I think at the surface defects, which are the Z eyes, nothing really wrong is going on. Uh, uh, so again, where does your W, uh, ZW model live? Like, I think. <laughs> WZW model, um, which, which term? Uh, uh, the, 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 the boundary th theories, where do they live? How the boundary I think theories, they, yeah, they live on sigma, the boundary theories. Or, or they live on this surface defect. They live on these disjoint unions of, of, the, um, of these copies of sigma. Yeah, and that's that. Yeah. I see. Okay, I no, that makes yeah. sense. You're right. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so you have this uh, gauge invariant action, and now you have this new field, which is the edge mode. And so I claim that this extended action is gauge invariant. So adding these two terms, which couple the edge mode to the gauge field, turn the action into a gauge invariant action. Okay, so now um, the question is, how does this extended action produce uh, two-dimensional integrable field theories? So um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the idea will be to start from this um, uh, connection, which doesn't have a DZ term, but it still has this uh, DZ bar term. We want to get rid of it because we want A to become the lax connection of the integrable field theory. So we want to kill this term. And the other thing we want to do is uh, note that we started with a smooth field smooth um, on CP1 without the zeta eyes. And what we want to do is turn it into something which is meromorphic. Okay. So the dependence on, on Z should go from smooth to being meromorphic. Okay. So this will be done in, in two stages and there'll be a, a yet a third stage. Um, so the first two stages are to get rid of this term and to turn the lax connection into a meromorphic connection. So the first stage is just, we can, Naively, just classically, we can just ignore this term. We can just focus on a subclass of connections which have uh, no DZ bar component. Uh, if you want, you can get rid of it by gauge transformation. You can gauge this away. So uh, after doing this gauge transformation, you're only allowed uh, residual gauge transformations which have this property that you don't reintroduce a DZ bar term. Okay, so we can reduce to this specific type of um, connection with just D sigma D DZ component, uh, D sigma D tau. So this lives on sigma, but it still depends on the spectral parameter on the CP1, okay? It has just two legs in the sigma. So if you, because it has two legs only in sigma, uh, the action simplifies a bit. So the Chern-Simons term, so this is the Chern-Simons of L, 
it just simplifies a bit. Uh, but this is just the extended action I wrote above. And if you derive the equations of motion for this action, um, bearing in mind again that um, this is the crucial thing that will be important later. So the, the edge mode and the gauge field, which I now call L. So notice I've changed the name. It's called L now because it will become the lax connection. Uh, these satisfy this constraint. So I vary the action with respect uh, su subject to this constraint. And what I get is these bulk equations of motion, which tell me that L is holomorphic away from the zeta i's. Uh, and then I get these defect equations of motion, which tell me that the pullback of the connection L to the defect is flat. Okay. So this starts to smell like an integrable field theory because I have holomorphicity of the lax connection. So I could start to call this a lax connection, but it's not quite a lax connection because we don't know yet that it's flat. All we know that it is that when you pull it back to the surface defect, in other words, when you evaluate, uh, so what the pullback is, is just uh, basically evaluating the lax connection at the Z, Z i's. So I have this collection of uh, evaluation at the, the Z's. And then this is um, a thing which is flat. Okay, it's valued in this defect Lie algebra and the claim is it's flat by the equations of motion. So what we want to do is, um, first of all, um, restrict to meromorphic connections, not just holomorphic uh, away from the punctures so that we get a meromorphic connection with the poles as, as we want for a lax connection. And we want to lift this defect equation of motion to a flatness for L itself, not just for its, to the, its restriction to the defect. Okay, so this will come about from um, the following. So, what we're going to do is restrict to, we're going to solve the bulk equations of motion. Okay, so this is just solving for the dependence of the lax connection or the, the connection A in terms of Z and Z bar. So we're just going to declare that uh, we take meromorphic solutions. So we're going to look at a class of solutions to the bulk equations of motion, which we call admissible. So these will be meromorphic solutions uh, with poles at the zeros of the omega. So these were where I had punctures on the CP1. Um, and then I'm going to require that uh, the poles of this meromorphic connection are no stronger than the orders of the zeros. So because my omega had simple zeros, my L will have simple poles at these, um, at these punctures. And another crucial uh, restriction, which will be important for the next proposition, is that I also want the, um, the curvature of my connection to also have no stronger poles than the order of the zeros. So because my omega had simple zeros at the zeta i's, I want my curvature to also not have more than first order poles at the zeta i's. So notice that because L has simple poles, potentially you could create higher order poles in this term by taking the commutator. So the, the point is that uh, this condition tells us that the commutator doesn't create higher order poles. Okay. So these are just um, restriction to a certain class of solutions, which will give rise precisely to the integrable field theories that we want. So we're looking at specific solutions of the bulk equations of motion. And now one reason for imposing this last condition is that it has precisely the effect of um, lifting the defect equation of motion to the lax equation of motion. So remember that the defect equation of motion tells us that the uh, pullback of the lax connection to the defect uh, is flat. But now, uh, if, if the connection was admissible, then in fact, uh, this equation lifts to the bulk. So in other words, we get a meromorphic uh, connection, which is uh, flat uh, on, on sigma. So it, it, this is really um, resembling a lot a lax connection. So it depends meromorphically on Z, and it, it has legs in D sigma and D tau, and it's flat on sigma. Okay. So, um, when I restrict to such a class of solutions for the bulk equation, my extended action um, reduces to this equation, to this action. So remember there was this uh, Chern-Simons term which had this form dz bar L. So this now goes away because I'm looking at solutions of the bulk equation. And um, my action now looks like this. So uh, what's nice is that this is really um, almost an integrable field theory because the claim is that its equations of motion are exactly the flatness of the connection l okay which is exactly what you'd expect for an integrable field theory so the gauge connection for 4d chan simons theory is now meromorphic and on shell flat okay so the only thing left is to connect the lax connection to the to the edge mode so the lax connection and the edge mode at this stage are just two independent fields they're just connected through this constraint 
So what we want to do is solve the constraint to be able to express the lax connection in terms of the fields of the theory. So remember that the, the lax connection is just some auxiliary connection, which is built out of the fields of the theory. And my claim is that the fields of the theory are in the two dimensional theory are the edge modes. They're the, the fields which are living on the, on the defect. And so the, the last thing to do is to solve this constraint to express the lax connection in terms of the defect fields. Okay. So uh, at this point, it becomes um, maybe a bit more technical. So I need to introduce this last piece of data to solve these equations. So uh, the reason it becomes more technical is because I need to make a further assumption. So at the, at the moment, we don't know how to relax this assumption, but this is just a technical assumption. We need to assume that uh, the one from omega has a double pole at infinity. So for example, uh, the PCM had this one over Z squared minus one DZ. So this minus one is a double pole at infinity because dz has a double pole at infinity. So this has a double pole at the origin and at infinity. And um, essentially all, all known examples of integrable field theories fall in this class with very few exceptions. So it's not such a strong restriction, but it would be nice to see how to relax this assumption. But assuming I can do this, assuming I'm focusing now on connection on meromorphic one forms with some double pole, which Actually, for convenience, I'm just choosing to be at infinity. Then I can um, use the gauge invariance uh, to partially fix some of my um, degrees of freedom. So my edge mode, which was this um, um, defect field, which transforms on the gauge transformation, I can fix its component at infinity. So remember that the, the defect group is really just a, a direct product of um, different copies of the Lie group. And so I just fix the copy at infinity. So this is over all the points in the finite plane. And this is the copy at infinity. I just use the gauge invariance to fix this component to the identity. So what I'm left with is just a, a defect field valued in some smaller defect Lie algebra, which is uh, associated to all the, all the surface defects except the one at infinity. Uh, I then also introduce the state notation for the pullback to the surface defects, but not the one at infinity. So um, so this is not quite D, it's some D prime. It's a different, different union. I don't, I don't include the surface defect at infinity. And then my constraint can be rewritten as follows. So now that I've fixed stuff at infinity, the constraint just reduces to the fact that um, my, the pullback of my lax connection to the surface defect without infinity should be um, after the gauge transformation by this edge mode or the edge mode with the component at infinity fixed should live in some isotropic subalgebra um, of, of uh, this um, smaller defect Lie algebra. Okay, so it's really the same thing as before. Uh, it's just this technical detail that I had to fix some gauge symmetries, but I really have the same constraint as before for just a smaller Lie algebra. And I'll, I'll explain why it's important to do this in a second. Okay, so, um, so I said that I want to look at admissible solutions to the, um, equations of motion, the bulk equations of motion. And so specifically, I'm gonna look at the following admissible solutions. So I want meromorphic solutions. And I'm gonna, I, I told you that the, by conditions, um, condition B, uh, the poles of L should be uh, the same, uh, same strength as the order of the zeros of omega. So because my omega I'm assuming has simple zeros, I can take my L to have simple poles at the zeros of omega, okay. So this is my lax connection and it has no constant piece. I can get rid of the constant piece because I've gauged away um, the component at, at infinity. So this solves my um, admissibility constraints A and B. And then the last thing I need to do is um, impose a condition to solve the third condition, the third admissibility condition. So remember this was essential to ensure that my defect equations of motion lifted to the bulk equations of motion, which guaranteed that my lax connection was actually a meromorphic flat connection, not just when you pull it back to the defect. Okay, so what I do is I introduce some um, operator E. So this is where the third part of my title comes in. So this is um, gonna give rise to what are called E models. So I have this um, linear map on the Lie algebra, on the defect Lie algebra, which is defined specifically as follows. So if I take an element of the defect Lie algebra, uh, because I've done this uh, gauge fixing of the degrees of freedom at infinity. What's so you know that if you have a meromorphic one form, it has two more poles than it has zeros if you count multiplicities. And so now that I've removed two poles, 
in fact, the remaining uh, poles, they're, they're equal in number to the number of, of zeros. And so what this means is that I have a, um, I can always represent an element of the defect Lie algebra as the uh, pullback of some meromorphic form to the defect. So I can always sort of um, view this as the evaluation of this uh, connection on the full space to the surface defect. And then what I do on this connection is I just flip the components at, so I, I choose a splitting of my zeros into two pieces, zeta plus and zeta minus. So I have a bunch of zeros, which are the poles of my lax connection. I just choose a splitting into um, equal parts. And then I just uh, flip the sign of, of, let's say the, the components of zeta minus. So I flip the minus, uh, flip the sign here, and then I can pull back to the surface defect again. And what this does for me is produce a linear map from the defect Lie algebra to the defect Lie algebra, which I call E. Okay. And then the, to solve the admissibility constraint C, all I can say is the following. So I can say that um, if I uh, apply this operator to the pullback of the lax connection, what this should equal is the Hodge star uh, acting on this pullback of the Lie algebra, a pullback of the um, lax connection. Okay, so the motivation for this comes from, in fact, um, the construction of E models uh, from, 4D uh, from 3D Chen Simons theory. So this is in this paper by uh, Pavel Severa. So he constructs uh, E models from uh, 3D Chen Simons. And it turns out that the constraints he imposes on the, on the 3D gauge field of Chen Simons theory is exactly this kind of field, uh, this kind of um, constraint. What are E models? E model is just a specific, it's, it's a very general class of, I'll mention in a second, it's a very general class of sigma models. Um, it's not really important for this talk what they are, but it's just, it turns out that uh, essentially all the integrable field theories that you wish to construct from 4D Chen Simons, they automatically turn out to be E models. Um, How do you get a, a in, integrable field theory from Chen Simons theory? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm almost- You're gonna explain this? this. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I'm a bit lost. Yes. So you said in the beginning that the uh, the, the boundary for Latin's condition is satisfied by the construction automatically, and then the bulk is not, and then there's some abstraction, and it, so and then you're trying to resolve it. Is it right or not? Yes. So let say that again. So I'm not. So I'm just trying I'm to understand what you're doing. Like you had on step okay, one there. Boundary, yeah, condition, boundary yeah, flatness yeah. condition and uh, okay. with the lax, right? So the aim of the game is uh, I'm trying to produce an action for a field theory which I want to be integrable, okay? And the claim is that this can come from 4D Chen Simons theory. So you start from the action for, from, for 4D Chen Simons theory, but you want to sort of... Um, uh, this makes sense. And your, your field theory will be con consist of edge modes, the H, right? Exactly. Yes. And exactly. there's like like in Wesley and Witten, there will be some the bulk modes, like with some yes. like okay. So now you're saying but, the mm, there'll be no bulk modes. I mean, the bulk mode will be the lax connection, if you like. The, the, okay. the only bulk field is the is the connection A, which is which is going to turn out to be the lax connection. So. Remember that in the homotopy pullback, the connection A is is connected to the edge mode. So what you want to do, this last step, is to uh, solve the constraint which relates the bulk mode, uh, the bulk field A to the edge mode, mm -hmm. to express the, the bulk field A entirely in terms of the edge mode. This is what you expect from a field theory. In a field theory, the lax connection is built entirely from the from the fields of the theory. It doesn't have any other spurious degrees of freedom. Right? The, the lax connection only knows about the fields of the model. It doesn't have okay. any new degrees of freedom. And, and what is the constraint we're solving now? So yeah, this joins... constraint. Yeah. So this came from, this was a, a crucial part of the homotopy pullback. It, remember that the homotopy pullback, it tells you that the pullback of the connection A in the bulk to the defect is not, e, is not valued in K, but it's valued in K up to the edge mode, up to gate transformation by the edge mode. Mm -hmm. So this is a constraint. And so you see, it's a relation between the lax connection and the edge mode. And what we want to do is solve this connection, this constraint. Ah, okay. just some, find some explicit. Find some explicit form. solution, yeah. Ah, I see, okay. So I'm gradually solving, see, I've solved the bulk equations of motion. And I've said, I'm doing that by saying I'm gonna restrict to meromorphic connections. And then I've said that if I, if I restrict a specific class of solutions, which have these three properties, then I have this extra property, this extra nice feature that the defect equations of motion become the zero curvature equation for my lax connection. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
So now I'm trying to construct for you explicit solutions which satisfy these three constraints. And the claim is that you can do this by introducing this E operator. So this is what I'm trying to do at the moment. So I'm trying to solve this constraint. And the way I do that is I restrict a certain class of admissible lax connections, um, which satisfy this, um, this condition. And I claim that I can, I can find solution of, uh, solutions of this um, constraint, um, which have this E model property. Okay. Um, so, okay, the, the upshot is just that I can solve this constraint. And in fact, I can find a unique solution given the following data. So I start with omega a choice of defect Lie algebra, uh, which is isotropic and uh, a choice of operator E, okay. So uh, this operator E was, the only choice here was just a choice of splitting of the zeros. And I chose that, I chose that uh, to, the, to half of these zeros, I changed the sign of the, of the lax matrix in the definition of this E operator. So it's just um, um, one tiny extra piece of ingredient. So from this data, I can now construct a unique solution to this constraint, which is given explicitly as follows. And so now this expresses for me uh, the lax connection or the gauge field of the Chern Simons theory in terms of the edge mode entirely. So the edge mode is now called L, L because I fixed the mode at infinity. And so this is really just uh, um, an expression for the lax connection in terms of the edge mode. So remember, this is a, an invertible map here. So in fact, I can, um, I can really lift this to an expression for the lax connection itself. So this will be a, a meromorphic um, connection uh, on sigma, which depends on L. And so it, it's defined uniquely by the fact that it's pulled back to the defect is given by this quantity. What's PL? PL is a projector onto, so I claim that with an E operator defined in this way, I have a decomposition of the defect Lie algebra into two pieces like this. And PL is just a projector onto this factor along the other factor. Okay, so I think, um, yeah, the, the technical details maybe here are not so important. It, it's, if you're interested, maybe you should um, read the paper, but I, I've tried to explain roughly what the idea is. You basically start from Chern Simons uh, with these edge modes, and then you uh, gradually, you solve the bulk equations of motion and you specifically concentrate on a class of solutions which have all the desired properties to produce a flat connection on shell. Uh, and, um, and in such a way that you can solve this constraint. So in other words, I can express the lax connection entirely in terms of the fields of the model. So once I've done all this, what I get at the end of the day is plugging everything back into the action, I get um, an action which depends only on the edge mode. And this is the action. So this is what people call the E model. So it's, it's a sigma model for this uh, group valued field L. So L is, is some field on sigma, which takes values in this defect Lie algebra. And it has this, uh, integral of a sigma term and this vesemina witten type term. So these were introduced actually uh, in 95, uh, but they introduced them very much more generally. So they didn't care about integrability. It turns out that the, the E operators, which I've constructed here, ensure that the model is integrable. So you can, you can think of this model more generally where E is just some linear operator on the defect Lie algebra. Or in fact, this is just replaced by some, some Lie algebra D. So uh, this is the E model in general, but it turns out that with the operators E, which I've constructed from the 4D Chen Simons, these theories are automatically integrable. So initially, Klimschik and Severa constructed these just as theories which have the nice property that they exhibit Poisson Lee T duality. So this is a non abelian generalization of T duality. Specifically, remember that part of the data of the theory which I've constructed for you is um, this isotropic subgroup of um, the defect Lie group. And so if you choose a different isotropic subgroup, what you get is a different model. But uh, the theory of klimschik severa tells you that actually these are Poisson Lie T dual if they're associated to the same E operator. So there's this overarching E model which lives on the, on the defect group and it has various reductions depending on different choices of isotropic subalgebras of the defect Lie algebra. And these are all Poisson Lie T dual um, to each other. And how are K and K uh, tilde related? They're, they don't have to be related in any way, except that they're both isotropic subalgebra. So um, the, the K prime is an isotropic subalgebra of GZ, and so is um, K twiddle prime. 
So these, so remember that you asked if there are different choices of isotropic subalgebras. If you have two choices, then you can construct two different models. And these two different models by construction will be Poisson Lee T dual because they're, they're related to some overarching E model. But, but, but somehow K determines K tilde, right? And vice versa. Not necessarily. Um, so you have you can have other choices. You can pick another. Suppose you have another isotropic subalgebra, K double twiddle prime. Then this will give you another model, and this will be uh, T dual as well. Okay, maybe so I don't understand how your T duality works. Okay. You, you, you have chains of uh, non-abelian T dualities. Um, but okay, maybe maybe. Okay. I, so typically, the way this is used um, is that you have complementary isotropic subalgebras. So you have K plus uh, K prime plus K twiddle prime, uh, their sum is the full algebra. Mm -hmm. And then this is the standard um, thing that people call Poisson Lee duality. So you have the model associated to this and then another model associated to the complement, the algebra. Uh, and then the, so this is a direct sum. And then uh, these, these are Poisson Lee dual. Okay. Um, so the upshot was just that. Um, out of this 4D chain Simon theory, we extracted a very large class of integrable models, and it turns out that they're essentially accidentally it was it was unexpected. They're all E models, which is a nice um, sort of unexpected outcome. Uh, especially for people who worked on integrable field theories, E models were becoming popular because people realized that various integrable models were all E models. But this is just showing that ac actually every single um, E mod, every single integrable field theory you could construct with these minimal um, data. So omega and isotropic subalgebra and some operator E, which is a very minimalistic data. So these are all E models in the sense that people were um, familiar with for, from specific examples. Okay, so um, maybe I can sum up. So um, what I've shown you is that, um, so to, to to make 4D chain Simon's theory gauge invariance, what you have to do is impose boundary conditions. And you can do this by uh, imposing them in a weak, in a weak sense, which is uh, in up to gauge transformations. And what this is introduces is the edge mode, which um, relates the, the bulk field to the, um, to the boundary fields uh, by gauge transformation. And then from this uh, 4D chain Simon's with edge modes, I showed you how to reduce down to a two dimensional uh, integrable signal model. Specifically, these are all E models. So uh, this construction of um, edge modes uh, via homotopy pullback, this was understood um, recently in a more general context in gauge theories. So we applied this to this particular context. So in their story, they applied this to theories with boundaries. Here, we don't have a boundary. We have a defect, which is co-dimension two. So it's a nice generalization of this story. Uh, everything I've said generalizes to higher order poles in omega. So I've focused here on simple poles, but everything works in, in higher order poles. Uh, you just get many more um, examples of integrable field theory. So in fact, we're able to build many new examples. So this is a sort of a constructive um, machinery which allows you to build new examples of integrable field theories. Um, so an interesting question is, can we generalize this construction to allow for more general solutions of the constraints, which would not be described by e-models? Maybe there are other classes of um, integrable field theories, which come out from 4D chain Simons, but which don't fall into this class of E-models. So, so far, we only know how to solve the constraint by this E-model condition, but it's possible that there are other, other ways to solve the constraint. Uh, I've focused here on, on Hamiltonian formulations of integrable field theories, sorry, on, on Lagrangian formulations, but um, it would be interesting to understand the relationship with uh, Godin models by studying the construction I've told you about in the Hamiltonian setting. So specifically, if, if, if you're familiar with integrability, you want to understand what is the underlying R matrix for these uh, integrable field theories and so on. And this passage to Hamiltonian formalism would be necessary to make a connection with affine Godin models. So it's known that uh, 4D chain Simons and affine Godin models are actually intimately related. Um, so the, if you perform a Hamiltonian analysis of 4D chain Simons, you get exactly the um, the Poisson algebra satisfied by the lax connection of a Godin model. So this is, um, this is understood, but what's not understood is how the boundary conditions in 4D chain Simon's theory relate to representations of the affine Katz-Mulli algebra. So if you remember, I told you that 
in the affine Godin model story, the way to build specific field theories is you choose a representation of this affine Katz-Moody algebra. And in fact, uh, any representation you want would produce some field theory out of, um, out of the Godin model. And um, what I try to show you in this talk is that uh, correspondingly in the 4D Chan-Simon study, what you do is you choose boundary conditions on the gauge field A at the surface defects. So this is 4D Chan-Simon theory with, with 2D defects, with surface defects. And so the question is, how do these boundary conditions at the surface defects relate to representations of the f and moody algebra? And possibly the most interesting question is, um, how do we quantize this whole story? So it, um, in the, the steps I've told you for how to actually get a two-dimensional integrable field theory, it looks very classical because I've told you, you need to solve these equations, you need to look at specific families of solutions and so on. So an important question is to understand how this construction generalizes um, to the quantum story. So can we extract 2D quantum integrable field theories from quantum 4D chern simons theory? So this is, I think, um, there's a paper uh, work in progress by Kostelia Yamazaki. This is part four of the series of papers. Um, but I think it will be interesting to understand in this language with, this, with these edge modes, how this works. So I should emphasize that their story is, um, they also extract integrable field theories but without the edge modes. So it's, it's a different mechanism for extracting the field theories from, um, from 4D and Simons. And uh, finally, yeah, it would be interesting to understand this connection, which I alluded to above between 4D and Simons and affine Godin models in the quantum story. So this is a, an interesting uh, question. So once you know how to quantize 4D and Simons, how is it related to um, quantum affine Godin, model, Godin models, which is a very active area of research. Okay, so thanks for your attention. Thank you. You mentioned that these um, E-type theories, they come directly from Trans-Simons. Can you spell this out? Maybe it was explain it out and I missed it. Oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So how do these E-models come about from 4D Trans-Simons? From 3D Trans-Simons. Ah, 3D, oh yeah, yeah, uh, okay. Okay, so this is an interesting story. Um, so it's called the Trans-Simons sandwich. So it's developed by um, Severa. So, what they do is they put 3D Chern Simons on a slab, which is like um, R2 cross an interval. And you'll see lots of similarities which, with what I talked about today. So this is two copies of R2 cross, uh, sorry, it's R2 cross an interval. And then uh, what you do is on one side, you put the E model boundary condition. So you, re you require that the restriction of the gauge field, or the bulk field A here, to this boundary, so A restricted to this boundary um, is, is equal to uh, the Hodge star on this restriction as well. So it's really similar to what I described. And then the condition on the other side, so the, the restriction of the gauge field to the other side should satisfy um, a similar condition to what I imposed, which is that if you restrict it to this uh, sigma prime, the other boundary, it should live in, in some isotropic subalgebra. So it's really the same, it's very similar. It's just that here they have a 3D field. And so there's no hope for obtaining integrable models out of this. So there's no auxiliary CP1. You see, what ensures integrability is that uh, you have this auxiliary spectral parameter which lives on a copy of CP1. So and this so, is like, um, can, can we relate it to pictures by, uh, by, by, thinking, by, shrinking this, by thinking of CP1 as like a sausage and then shrinking it? To an interval, like um, yes. basically, basically quartering out by the circle action. I mean, this is you something get that, I, right? Yeah, I, I think this is a, an interesting question. I, I don't know, but it would be very interesting to relate this 3D picture to the 4D picture. There's clearly very, very close similarities. Um, the differences, as I said, one of them, 4D, 4D Chen Simons ensures integrability, whereas this formalism of Severa allows you to construct general E models, which are not necessarily integrable. So yeah, I think maybe some mechanism by which you sort of, yeah, stretch out the sphere to a cylinder. But, um, so, so I still don't actually understand because uh, this construction tells you what to do on one of your punctures or yeah. on two punctures simultaneously. Um, yeah, good question. So uh, in the story I told you, uh, so here you have two boundaries, right? But in the story I told you, there's really just one, one, one class of defects. It's the things at the ZIs. So let's just say there's Z2, Z, Z1, Z2, Z3. 
So you have three surface defects in this example. And what you do first is you say that uh, the gauge field, it's uh, when you pull it back to the surface defect and you gauge transform it by H, this should be valued in K, okay? And then uh, when, you, when you impose these boundary conditions in this homotopic way, so there's no conditions on A per se. So you can then also impose the condition that uh, it's pullback is uh, satisfying this extra condition. So I impose this later on in the construction, but I think you could impose these two conditions at the same surface defects because I'm not imposing the conditions that A takes values in K at the surface defects strictly or strongly. I'm imposing it weakly. And I think this allows me to impose this extra boundary condition at the same point because um, you see that the boundary condition is sort of a relation between A and H. It's not a boundary condition on A per se. So I'm claiming that uh, this, this can be imposed further on top of the homotopic boundary condition. I think this is what, this is what should allow one to relate it to this story, where there are two, two sides. Uh, on, you impose these two things on, on either side, but here we're imposing everything at, at the same surface defects. It's the same pullback. I'm pulling back to the same surface defect in both, both conditions. And so for this story, it, it was crucial that I, I sort of impose these band, boundary conditions weakly. If I impose them strongly, I, I couldn't do, I couldn't then further impose this condition. This, these would be inconsistent boundary conditions. So if I pose this and this condition, I just get that the, the restriction is zero to the boundary. Okay. So I'm not exactly sure how, but I think it's an imp important question to understand how these constructions are related, yes. Yeah, I, so, I mean, to some of theory is topological, right? So at the point where mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you become uh, purely topological and not holomorphic, you don't mm -hmm. really have the sense of the distance. So maybe uh, well, it wouldn't, okay. I don't think I understood all the details, but the picture would have looked better if, if somehow you could get a top picture from the bottom picture with two punctures. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, you mean, yes, exactly. Somehow you want to get the top picture from the bottom one. And I'm not sure how to do this yet. If I knew that would be, yeah, I, I would tell you, but this is something that, that's interesting to understand yet. Are there any more questions? It's possible that the story I told you about Winslow lines is not correct in that our, our story was in six dimensions. And out of mm -hmm. those six, three play almost no role. And if we cut, if, 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 we had somehow gotten confused about <laughs> which three, which of the three directions completes the four. Um, then you should also be able to introduce Wilson lines. It will be admittedly, so your story is different from, from Costello and Yamazaki. It's like totally different, right? Yeah, so, it's yes, a different, different approach to getting two dimensional uh, integral. I, I like this better. <laughs> this sounds better than, uh, than, than, than. Yeah. So yeah, the key thing is to introduce these edge modes. And I think this is what made the relation to E models possible because you see, as I explained, this condition, lifting the condition from a strict one to a weak one is what allows you to impose this further condition, which is inconsistent with the original condition. Um, and what's nice is that the edge mode, which comes about from this homotopical construction, it really it turns out to be exactly the field theory and the field of the two dimensional integrable field theory. So, the data is already there once you've constructed this gauge invariant action by homotopy pullback. Yeah, it... mm. And I guess quantization is 
technical but perturbatively straightforward no mm, yes i mean potentially perturbatively possible yes i agree so what um, kind of things do people do with these integral field theories now that you have it what do you do with it what's it good for <laughs> uh well um what's nice about them is that they have infinite number of symmetries and you can study them exactly you can solve them exactly you know you can find the exact eigenvalues for all the states of the theory and so on so the fact that it's it's got so many symmetries means it's it's exactly solvable that's why people like them so do you, so you want to construct mm -hmm. yeah you can construct exact ace matrices or compute the spectrum of the infinite tower of integrals of motion and so on you know using the bit ansatz and such so the, for, so to, for example in the, the godard model is very well understood uh, in the um, finite dimensional story and this is work developed by uh, Frankel and company. So they understood that there's a very strong connection between Godin models and Langland's duality. And the spectrum of the Godin model Hamiltonians is described by Langland's dual pairs. And so this story, so although it's not apparent from the 4D Chan Simons story, because 4D Chan Simons is at least classically equivalent to um, Affan Godin models, the idea is that um, underlying the description of the spectrum of these theories is an affine generalization of the Langlands correspondence for affine algebra. So in other words, you want Langlands duality over surfaces, not over curves. And so um, I think in this 4D Chen Simon story, you sort of see the curves because you see it's like CP1 cross CP1. There's like a curve, sorry, a, a surface in, in, in C2. But uh, this is all very speculative. And it's believed that the spectrum of affine Godin models is described by some affine pairs for the Langlands dual algebra. And this is related to this so-called ODIM correspondence, if you've heard of it. So it's, it's a way of describing the spectrum of quantum theories using classical ODEs. And Can you elaborate how this would be related? How? Um, so how affine Godin is related to affine opers. Yeah, so um, this is- a, Well, I, I know the ordinary yeah, story. Yeah. yeah, so it's, I mean, the affine version is, is very speculative, it's conjectural. So the idea is you just put, you affinize everything. So you, you have the, the Godin model, which is um, associated to some finite dimensional Lie algebra, but now we're looking at an affine Godin model and its spectrum should be described by Langland's dual affine opers. So this is something that still remains to be understood. It's, it's very poorly understood, I think. Um, we know some examples of how this works. Uh, specifically, KDV is the best understood case. It's the theory that was originally described as a Godin model by Fagan and Frankel. Uh, but the general picture is, is completely open, I think. At least mathematically, it's very poorly understood. Yeah. So it's really just a question of affinizing everything. And so there's a naive expectation of what the spectrum of Godin models in the affine story should be, and it, they should be described by affine pairs. You can check that this is indeed the case in, in various cases, but there's no proof of this and no understanding of how, how this Langlands duality is generalized to this affine setting. Um, so, I mean, you, you've worked on these quantum Q Langlands, but this is sort of affine Langlands, it's another direction. Which probably you could obtain as a limit of quantum Q deform, Q deform Langlands. I don't know. Because there's this relation between affinization and quantization. This thing shouldn't have any... The, what makes it interesting is that um, I think your story should already have all of the all of the the, the Q Langlands in it. The Q Langlands. Yeah, because uh, the Q Langlands is, is essentially a story about it. It comes from the same world as integrable uh, lattice models. So the Q deformation yeah. is the same Q that deforms KZ to QKZ. So there's yeah. no more room to do anything else, no, uh, or less. It's just yeah. the same. And um, what makes this 4D Simon theory interesting is that 
um, is that it does seem to really contain all the information in it of yes of the that, that goes into into the the, the Q line. I was I didn't believe it at all, but you calculate yes. and it does, so it's yeah. tracking. Um, so it can, yeah, it contains the usual Q line lens through line defects, but now this is a this is a further extension where you look at surface defects and this is yeah so i contain... think i understand surface defects so why should i say you're sorry okay. <laughs> completely um, okay which is what but so there's yeah then there should be some way of understanding affine langlands in this in this setting once you look at surface defects in 4d transignments i mean that's the claim it's not really a you don't think it's affine? It's not really affine. Um, and introducing surface defects, well, yeah. if the if it works the way I imagined it works, mm -hmm. it's not related to affinization. Well, surface defects are related to infinite dimensional representations of the group. So there is something infinite there. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and they will fill out space directions differently <laughs> than line defects do. If, yes. if you correctly identified which space directions we are talking about, yes. which uh, <laughs> it's possible that uh, in my head uh, it was some sort of a glitch, um, which is um, yeah. But um, but then um, uh, but then introducing surface defects mm -hmm. is uh, I mean is 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 studying Langlands with or without ramifications. It's not a different Langlands. It's the Langlands with or without ramifications. But I thought Langlands with ramifications allows you to consider Godard models with irregular singularities, finite Godard models. I mean, this is non-affine. So I, for me, so ramifications- So then it's possible that you're doing something else, that it's not, it's not what I had in mind. And this, is, and okay. this would explain the mismatch. There's not, nothing went off with my head wrongly. Then you're doing some, I mean- I um, So- because for me, for example, on, on CP1, you have to use ramification because otherwise there's no moduli on CP1, right? So on, on, an, on, a, on a high genus Riemann surface, you have moduli, but on, on CP1, you don't have moduli. So you need to put ramifications at certain points. And these are the ZIs, the, the, the poles of the Godin. Right. Line. So for me, um, Langlands with ramification is a way of understanding finite Godin models, but with uh, with high order singularities. So, okay. I mean, um, what what surface defect in my world would have been was not is isn't um, isn't it, you would be inserting Verma module representations um, of the yes. of the finally algebra, not the finite dimensional ones, but the infinite dimensional ones. Yes, that's right. And uh, and whether once you do that, you can rewrite them in the way you can, I somehow can't see, I, I can't see fast enough in my head, but mm -hmm. it's a sharp thing whether, you know, is this all that it is? Uh, presumably uh, Fagan and Frankel would have, um, would have said so if it is, but I didn't read their paper, so I don't know. <laughs> um, but so I think the, 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 the thing is maybe maybe why it's affine is that there are really two affinizations. So the affinization in the Fagan-Frenkel story is in, an affinization coming from the spectral parameter. So the, the, the parameter Z is sort of the loop parameter in the Fagan-Frenkel story. And what they have is a critical central extension on the CP1, if you like. And so what you, what you attach to each of these points is a Verma module for the affine Katsumuri algebra at critical level. But this, there's no extra copy here of CP1. It's purely, I mean, no, no extra copy of sigma. It's purely CP1. And on the CP1, because you have this local parameter Z, you have an affinization around each point. And uh, this is why you can attach to every point a copy of, of affine algebra. And what well, they look at is, is the associated uh, vacuum Verma module, which is a vertex algebra, and they build uh, the Godin model out of this affine algebra at critical level. But this is how they got also the ordinary Godin model, right? Exactly. I mean, no, exactly. They just started. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Of course, I'm describing the usual Godin model story. Exactly. Right. 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 But I'm saying, I'm saying, in that story, there's an affinization which comes from the fact that right, you're working exactly. with CP1. Exactly. But but now there's an extra affinization, which I think is why it's affine Godin. You see, the affinization is this extra copy of C of CP1 or, or sigma. Because you can put vertex algebras on on these on these R2s. On each surface defects, you can have vertex algebras. Um, but which, are you starting with a, 
the, the infinite dimensional representation that you're putting in each hat is yeah. still a representation of the little G hat that we started out with, that we got the ordinary uh, Godel model from, or not? Um, are, are we just putting Vermont modular representations of that algebra? We're doing something else. Something else, I think. It's not clear what to do at the moment, I think. So I think these, so I'm really sure that this story is related to um, quantum toroidal algebras. This is work of Fagin, Mukin, and Jimbo. So um, this is really a double affinization that they're looking at. And it really smells like their story is sort of a deformation of what could be going on here. You know, these papers by Fagin, Mukin, and, and um, Jimbo. So, um, at some point, one runs out of hats and you can't go of any course, further. Yes, so course, I think course. we're close to running out of hats. Yeah, I think we've run out of hats. <laughs> There's not that many things that you can do. Yes, um, but there, there are two hats, I claim, and we've run out of hats once we've put these two hats. I agree. <laughs> but I think, I mean, the, in the usual uh, Fagin Frankel story, there's an extra hat you can put, this is for sure. And that's the hat which is which is being introduced here. It's the extra affine direction corresponding to the fact that you're dealing with a field theory. So the usual Godin model is describing finite dimensional integrable systems. Once you affinize the Lie algebra, you're describing field theories. This is what I tried to explain in the beginning. The, the representations of, of uh, affine Godin models are field theories. Okay. And the field is precisely this new affinization, which you didn't have in the usual Godin model. So there's a spectral parameter affinization, which is the one which we're familiar with from Fagin Frankel. And then there's the field theory affinization, which is, which is new. And I think what's nice about the 4D transcendence story is you see both of them. There's two copies of CP1, really. Two, two sort of two surfaces. And so again, to, what, what Fagin Frankel did was understand how the description of the spectrum of the finite Godin model is related to affine up or to Langland's dual opens um, via um, Langland's correspondence. It's, it's, it's a particular um, instance of the Langland's correspondence over CP1, right? But now we're dealing with CP1 cross CP1. So it's, it's sort of Langland's over a surface. What they did was in essence, not that Fancy. They just use integral representations of conformal blocks. That's actually yes. all that happens. Yes. I, I mean, it's so it's, it's not actually, <laughs> you can call it Langlands, which it is. It's a demonstration of Langlands, but yes. um, technically it's not, they didn't, it wasn't rocket science. Um, <laughs> but so, what, yeah, my, my intuition is trying to extend what they've done because you see, my perspective on field theories is that just, Godin models for some affine algebra. So the question is, given we know how to quantize and study finite Godin models using Langlands or, or whichever approach you prefer, the question is how does that extend to the affine setting? So from my understanding, their work is related to finite Langlands. And so the question is, is what's going on for field theories underpinned by an affine Langlands correspondence? Well, so in some sense, yeah. There is one more affinization in string theory, um, which which does go beyond um, beyond the, the stuff that goes in Q Langlands, but it goes in the other direction, which is um, uh, uh, you can make the the Lie algebra affine, um, and um, I didn't think that this was. That was not related to Costello Yamazaki. Costello Yamazaki did not make the Lie algebra fine. It was not. In other words, it had to deal with a little. So, the, the making the Lie algebra fine is analogous to instead of working with little string theory, you're working yeah. with a ten-dimensional string. Okay. That's the one more thing you could do. But I don't think this <laughs> is this what's going on here. Yeah, Someone would. It doesn't smell. It doesn't smell like that. So I agree that in their story, you don't make the Lie algebra affine. It stays finite, finite, right? Because you're dealing with a Chan Simons theory for a finite Lie algebra, finite group. But somehow in the parallel with Godin, you see this, I, I told you that this extra copy of sigma, what, what you can think of it as, of as is a cylinder, if you compactify, and then 
um, what you're dealing with is a field theory on the circle, and this is um, sort of the extra affine direction. You're looking at a loop algebra. So or, maybe, or could, yeah. can it, maybe, maybe I can try to say again what, what it is that you're telling yes. me. And so if they got, if they got the finite Godin model story by basically mm -hmm. starting uh, with the Knizhnik zimological equation of an, of an affine Lie algebra, yes. they'll get this story by starting with a Knizhnik zimological equation of a double affine algebra. Yes, yes, exactly. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I think this is the extra direction that you need. Case yeah, you could do that. For double affine algebra, yes. That's right. That, that is the full string theory version of, of the story then. Okay. Well, the full string theory and then some funny limit where you get a field theory. Oh God, <laughs> this is really weird. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we'll keep the dilaton fixed, okay. but we'll still take a string like the zero. So you get a field theory, gravity, super gravity, 10 dimensions. Okay. <laughs> okay, maybe, um, okay, interesting. I know this doesn't sound like a helpful thing to do. <laughs> Do, do these double affine algebras make sense? Miroslav, do they make sense? I'm not sure, uh, but I was just about to ask a question, um, actually. Do you get some non-trivial structure from colliding the, uh, the punctures? Yeah, so this is a way to produce higher order poles in the lax connection. So it, 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 we mm -hmm. were talking about the ramification so if you collide poles, you can create higher order poles. That's one thing you yeah. can do. Yeah. And can you write down explicitly the coupling of the of the fields on the collided defect? Uh, yeah. Can, can you can write down the, the coupling explicitly? After coupling the of the fields to the collided defect. The edge, the edge mode ah, fields yeah. to the bulk. Ah, yeah. Yes. Uh, so this was. Um, you basically coupling um, this Dabu derivative to the connection or to the pullback to the defect. So the edge mode is living on the defect and you take its derivative and then you, pull, you, you pair it with the, the pullback of the bulk field to the defect. This is the coupling right. of the and edge now mode. I, uh -huh. Now my question is if you have uh, two such po uh, points yeah, and yeah. put them yes. to uh, the each other, you're going yeah. to get uh, yeah. some second so, order pole in A, right? Uh, yeah. And the fifth order in the second order pole is going to uh, be coupled to some field. That there's going to be some kind of combinations of the fields on the two separated original uh, original uh, edge modes. Yes. And my question is, is this gives to some kind of non-trivial structure, some kind of co-product or something on uh, these. Yeah. Uh... Mm. I'm not sure because you see what you what happens when you collide is that um, so basically you're taking two copies of the Lie algebra and these are at points Z1 and Z2 and when you collide them what you're producing is one copy of the Katsumudi algebra tensor um, C epsilon over epsilon squared so you're sort of merging the two into one sort of double loop algebra, which is truncated at order two, if that makes sense. Um, you, you can do this collision and um, this is how the sort of the data rearranges itself um, when you collide the poles. Um, but I'm not sure you get a co-product structure. I can't see how to do that. Um, it's more than a product because you see you're not getting you're not taking two cats and getting a new cats out of it. You're really sort of blowing it up to some bigger thing. Um, so I don't know if uh, that probably doesn't answer your question, but I don't know. I don't know how to see what you're asking a co-product out of this. Um,
It's a very interesting story. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> lots of things to understand. <laughs> yes. Thanks for joining okay. us. <laughs> Thanks very much for the invitation. Thank All you. right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye.